Rolling Stone says that the creator economy already involves somewhere between 50 million. Wow, coffee. Somewhere between 50 million and 200 million folks. Goldman Sachs says the creator economy could be worth half a trillion dollars by 2027. We're going to have a conversation with someone who's been a part of this since 1997. Yes, folks, he was selling stuff on eBay since 1997. The one and only Dion. How you doing? Howdy. I think I think a lot of people were selling things on eBay in the day, you know, all the way back to when it came out or or just online websites. But I don't know that there were too many people that were selling things that didn't exist. <laughs> I, yeah, they were selling these these things that were won in video games that other people wanted. And uh, there you go. You were you were selling NFTs before they were called NFTs, I guess. Pretty much. And so uh, most people are aware of games like Halo, World of Warcraft, League of Legends, Guild Wars, like all of the massive MMO players out there. But there was a game in the 90s called Ultima Online. It's the first one I remember. And it was, you know, they would say millions, but it was thousands of people playing in a virtual world that doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. And I was actually a real estate flipper in 1997. The, the game had a limited amount of space and you could find the actual space that was designed to accept what you would call a house uh, or, and it could be anywhere from a little cod cottage up to a castle. And wow. so you had limited space to find it. You had to re gather the resources to do this, to build the house to buy the deed for the house, to do all of these things that would take weeks in the game. And people are lazy. So they don't want to take those weeks. And then the way the game was, is if you didn't log in in a certain number of days and refresh your house, it would actually disappear. You could lose your ah. land in the house. So there would be times where I would spend an entire weekend basically camping the countdown on a house. If somebody didn't log in, this one would go in. I could place a house there and easily make somewhere between 30 and and $100 place in that house. But then the flipping came from people not realizing that there was an economy that can be converted into actual dollars. Mm. So I would buy a house in game currency for the equivalent of two or three dollars in real money and then resell it for hundreds of dollars in real wow. money. Because the the translation between in-game currency and real money wasn't in most people's um, minds at all. Right. And uh, the most I made in one weekend was about fourteen hundred dollars selling a castle. And so it was it was it turns into real money every now and then, but that wasn't a very common occurrence. Usually it was, again, just like when I played World of Warcraft, easy to make three to five hundred dollars a month because if it became easier to make more than that, enough people would do it to where whatever game you were in, they would change and take that. Yeah. away. yeah, the reason I want to talk about the creator economy with someone who's been a part of it for so long is, there's just so many ways to be a part of it. And I had no idea, right? I didn't know what the creator economy was. I didn't know you could do virtual land flipping or castle flipping or, you know, I never played those those games, right? I was too busy working or sleeping uh, for most of my uh, 20s. And um, I just think a lot of people need to realize that they can take their area of interest and monetize it, right? When I think of the conversations we've had over the years, You've monetized lots of different things, not only playing video games, but you also uh, use Amazon affiliates and Audible, I don't know, affiliates. I don't know what else to call it. And, you know, in a bad month, I think you told me one time you make a thousand bucks. That took a long that. time to ramp up. Uh, if you make it to where I can share my screen, I'll show you what my new plan is. But oh, yeah, it took a long time, a long, I mean, years to, to amp up, to ramp up to where that Amazon affiliate would, would make money. And I, it was long before YouTube. I did this through social media. Uh, yeah. I don't think it was quite back to the MySpace era, but it was Facebook links in chats before people would monitor their chats and take it to where you couldn't put in links because there wasn't in as many bots. Right. And a lot of people think, well, so I'll make a video now on here's the locks I use in my right. rentals. Okay, and I'll do a comparison. Matt uses a certain lock. I use a certain lock. I tried his for six months, didn't like it, went back to mine, make the video. And I say, hey, there's a link down below. You can look at them. It's not that somebody's going to buy the link. Right. right? They're gonna, but what it does is the way Amazon works is if they click on the link and they go there and they use your link to get there, it puts a cookie on that device for 24 hours where anything purchased on Amazon is tied to, just like they were buying my lock, whatever item right. they're buying. And sometimes it's, seven cents right sometimes it's 17 dollars mm. right 
But I think yeah. going forward, I have a plan. Oh, look at only homes. What the heck is this? So the the good nature of who you are is because you didn't put that together. <laughs> have you heard of OnlyFans? Of course, OnlyFans. Only yes. homes. Okay. That's my thought. I think we put that together. We put Mike on the cover. Millennial Mike. <laughs> millennial, millennial Mike, not millennial, me. We'll be clear, right? <laughs> not Zuber. Millennial he can't, Mike. He can't wait to take his shirt off anytime. We would, um, did you see the interviews we did on the streets of Vegas where we had the Flamingo girls and the... I did see a couple. I did not see the one where he ripped off his shirt. I've been told so it's I, out there. I, did this, I have not seen it. I, I did the ones with the Cowboys. So we found guys with their shirts off too. We wanted to be fair to the genders, right? Sure. And I'm sorry, I think there's only two. But Mike was like, oh, I'll interview the Cowboys too. So he takes his shirt off, which is interesting. Of course. Hey, well, I if you've worked that hard to have, you know, six-pack abs, go ahead. Ex exactly, right. I mean, because you would really not ever want to be the guy who worked that hard to have those six-pack abs and then gets shown up by a 50-year-old in three different yeah. workout routines. Yeah, 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 three different times. <laughs> I'd go take but... my shirt off and, and try to make up for that too. <laughs> so uh inside joke inside joke but we'll, we'll digress but so, so so a only homes that a real thing or are you that is not a real thing the idea is you can monetize anything right there there's almost nothing that you can't monetize if you have a skill or a hobby the way that youtube works and we're in the financial space so a lot of people watching youtube are thinking like I was in the beginning. I was like, okay, Graham Stefan is really killing this at YouTube thing. And he bought some rentals and he talks about, it. there's a bunch of people that want to do that. There's this many people on YouTube trying to figure out how to own rentals. Yeah, there's this tiny. many people trying to figure out what car they're going to buy next. Mm. There, what all the DIY projects you can do. Now, don't look up eye handy. If you're going to be doing drywall work, just don't do that. You don't want to see that, but you could take any hobby that you're doing. And yeah. you can put it into a format that there is a market for. Yeah. That's what I want to talk about. Again, I I really do believe, for whatever reason, when I look at the numbers and, and I work, you know, I talk with Sean Cannell from Think Media uh, fairly regularly. And a lot of the numbers skew towards Gen Z and millennials for these, um, you know, for the creator economy. I want Gen X and baby boomers to wake up I've talked with lots of creators, uh, kind of leaders in the space, and there's an open community for Gen X and baby boomers to share their passion. And why that's you have no idea how much value you have. If you're Gen X or baby boomers, there's a very good chance that you have 20 plus years of whatever you love. And there's a community of folks out there that want to hear from you. And again, it doesn't have to be finance. It doesn't have to be cars. It could be whatever. If you could find a tribe of three, four, five thousand people and niche down to that, you there you can monetize. And again, I can tell you, there's nothing better than monetizing something you love to do. It never feels like work. Here's an example of of the the older generation that doesn't seem to be taking advantage of the tech like this. About. Two, three years ago, just before I, I, went, I went to retire in 2022. So in 2022, I took a cruise, which was kind of like my my test feet in the waters of, you know, what would I do? Mm. And so if you if you have never gone on a cruise before and you decide, okay, I'm going to go on a cruise, what do you do? You go to YouTube. You think, mm -hmm. what's the best way to book a cruise? What cruise, what cruise line, what cruise area? And there were channels with four or 500,000 views on a video by people's in, people in their 60s or 70s. Because yeah. who has the experience of taking enough cruises to have an opinion on it? Generally, that's not going to be your 30-year-old. Well, there's your market if you're 30. You should be the new young cruise experience person because the people that were 60 or 70 weren't actually even talking about the excursions because they're not oh, taking yeah. them. They yeah, were talking about the cruise line, the time of year to book, how to understand the weather patterns, how to all of those things. And so that's somebody who's 10, 20, 25 right. years older than us yeah, with hundreds of thousands of views on each video, not just like on their channel, but on each video that came out. Yeah, no, I've, it, it, I've watched several of those. I've, I've actually used YouTube to pick our next vacations and, and just to use cruises, Olivia and I've done probably 20 of them, right. On, on all, all different lines, right. The tippity top six star down to a three and a half star, right. Depending on the line. So we, we've done, we've done lots of those, but again, the point is Gen X baby boomers, there's opportunities like, 
think about all the ways you monetize you know what you're doing today right so we've already talked about video games we've already talked about amazon links what other ways are you monetizing just by being dion so uh, i take this example from um they were rei stoners now it's martin properties josh and mary in the, yep. in the watch our content that have their own youtube channel they have a home depot affiliate link oh there you go imagine yeah. if you were making videos in real estate like if you were lumber matt the lumberjack landlord and you have yeah. All of the instructions on this is how you do rehabs. And he maybe doesn't have a Home Depot affiliate link. We can learn from the person who just made a channel this yeah. year or last year and say, we can incorporate that too. Yeah. Um, I make money by being me. You said, you never know. You might have something that you've done for years or decades where you have experience. There are lists that you can get on that attorneys go to when they look for expert witnesses. Yeah. So I've worked in law enforcement. I've been a truck driver. I've been a CDL instructor. So every year I do, and I, and I call it expert witness testimony. There's probably a more official term for it because people think, well, you're an expert witness. You, you, you witness things as an expert. No, I have knowledge on a subject that an attorney might not be able to present in a courtroom with authority. But right. when somebody comes in and says, I've worked in IT sales for the last 20 years. And here's how this process procedure usually goes and where the reasonable expectation of awareness is. That's something I couldn't do, but that's, you know, mm -hmm. somebody else yeah. has that experience. Right. I can talk about what, what should a truck driver do in a situation? What is reasonable and necessary for them to have as a basis and make, I basically charge a thousand dollars to be retained. Mm -hmm. And then it's $150 an hour if it goes to depositions or to trial or anything. It very rarely goes to trial, I think, once so far. And I'll do four or five of those a year. Mm -hmm. And the, the trick was in the beginning, it was you, you get on the list and you don't have a history. So you might get one or two cases. But right. once you have one or two, and now that firm just keeps your info because they might not go back to the list and pay the, the fee right. to find the witness on there. They'll just reach out to me directly and say, hey, we've got this new case on this subject. And it's usually... It's kind of like nobody wants jury duty, but if you're in jury duty, everybody goes, tell me about the case. Right? Right. It's the same thing. You know, nobody, I can't talk about a case when you're talking about it, but afterwards you can go, here's, here's an image of a driver, eyes closed singing mm. for 30 seconds before the accident. And here's what happens when the accident happened. And, you know, after the case, you can do that kind of stuff. And that is money that is based on your knowledge yeah. more than anything. Yeah, there's, I mean, there's lots of ways to do this. Uh, again, I'm drawing a blank on on uh, the young man that does this, but he does, he basically gets paid to go to dinner uh, with Todd his Baldwin. wife. Yeah, Baldwin. Why do I keep forgetting Mr. Baldwin? He's amazing. Todd Baldwin. Shout out to the Baldwin family welcoming baby girl here shortly. Um, Todd Baldwin does, you know, this, he gets paid to be a, a shopper, secret shopper. Just think about that, right? Never have to pay for date night, secret shopper. Um, but you know, if, if we go back to things that I've accidentally done, I like, there are some people that do side hustles on purpose. Everything I've done since 2018 has been an accident. Um, just leaning forward, moving. So create a YouTube channel, thousand videos, eventually get monetized. Everybody thinks AdSense. So th the really funny thing is I just did my taxes this last weekend and the one rental at a time kind of umbrella LLC, right? Because separate real estate and education or media or whatever, right? Separate. Um, multiple six figures again. But what you know, why the crazy wrinkle? AdSense was 12% of that. AdSense was 12%. So 88% of that came from other things, which I don't think people realize. I think people look at YouTube and AdSense as the thing. I want people to hear this. It's not the thing. It's everything that it can spawn after that. It's wild to think about. I was going to do the math really quick. I'll tell you if you ask. 18%. For you? Of revenue for from Dion Talk last year came from AdSense. Oh, see, again, I think that's powerful. I, I don't think people get it. You do YouTube, if you're doing it right, in my opinion, AdSense is not the goal. It's the things that you could do after that. 
that's crazy, right? Well, look, I mean, it would be really hard for Millennial Mike to figure out the, the separation of what he makes from real estate and what he makes from YouTube because he is a genius when it comes to, here's the platform. I'm the yep. king of Gary. And not because he goes, I'm the king of Gary. If you have to say you're the king, you're not the king. But he's exactly. the king because if you look up investing in Gary, Indiana, you get 100 Millennial Mike videos. Like he's the, exactly. the person that pops up. So he, he's getting deals brought to him. He's getting private lenders come to him to recycle capital to buy the next deal. And so he's commingled those in a, in a way to where the AdSense is, is, is no, probably a recognizable percentage, but a really small one. No, it's probably single digits. And again, this is this is what I want Gen X and, and baby boomers to know. And again, shout out Millennial Mike for doing the work. That's what he does. He wasn't just the king of Gary, Indiana in a day, a week, or a month. It's probably taken him a year and a half to two years to put together all of that. But he does it on purpose. Think think years, right? Um, I mean, just for example, so when I did my one rental at a time tax return, this so AdSense, books, um, Audible. So Audible, thank you, Dion, for being the the narrator for both of my books. Uh, still can't believe you did that. And by the way, did it for free. So thank you for that. Just so people realize, uh, I'm not. I didn't pay for that. You just you just did it. Pretty awesome. What's, what's funny is you gave me a skill that I can market because I can reach out to Audible now and become a narrator and get you know three to five thousand dollars to narrate a book. And I'm never ever going to. It <laughs> it's be hard. Twenty thousand dollars a book I, for free for a friend? Absolutely, all day long. Right. But for it's money, great. no. No, it's like, I'm going to cross that off the list. I'm not monetizing that. Nope. <laughs> yeah. So books, uh, AdSense, uh, um, courses, obviously a little bit of swag, a little bit of referrals. I'm trying the Amazon thing. Um, we did an event I've done I, last year. I did online events and an in-person event. Uh, I might even be missing, but I mean, just think about all those things. And what I want people to realize is I did those in a serial fashion. I think a lot of people think, you know, side hustle and they try to create too big. It was very much a series of things and they build over time. What do you think of that? So I, it builds over time. And so for me to invest in real estate, it had to be, you know, it's never going to be easy, but it had to be as easy as I could make it. I had to have systems in place to where it was almost as automated as possible. I had auto searches from agents. I wasn't doing driving for dollars or mailers or anything that took effort. It was the effort of talking to an agent to say, here's my criteria. Can you set up an auto search? Then hunting for the deals. I can do that while working full time. I could do that while raising three kids. So the easier I made my systems, the more likely I was to continue with real estate. The easier I automate things when it comes to. So I could have done all kinds of things as a side hustle and sold things online. Mm -hmm. But if I could play a video game like World of Warcraft with my kids, have yeah. a couple of computers set up, play time together next to each other, and then monetize it. So what hobby can you do with your kids? from mm -hmm. fishing, hunting, old car, restoring, whatever you can trick your kids into doing with you yeah. that you can then monetize. The yeah. easier you make it, the more likely you are to continue. And again, if you, again, talk to a CPA, but if you make that a business and you make a legitimate effort to make a profit, you can move some below the line expenses to above the line expenses. And if you don't know what that is, talk to an accountant. I'm going to use your example of video games. Again, I'm just making assumptions. It was done on purpose as an entity to make profit. You could write off the video game. You could probably write off the Wi-Fi or at least part of it. You could write off the gaming uh, uh, platforms. You could write off the cameras that are recording or the applications that do the screen capture. I don't know. But there's all kinds of stuff that go into producing that for profit that go above the line and below the line. If you don't know the difference of that, you are forgetting... That in my opinion, the IRS tax code is a reward system, not a punishment. It's a re change your mindset. The IRS tax code is a reward system, not a punishment system. Yeah. The, uh, having an income outside of your W-2 is a way to do a, a wage hack, like a house hack. Exactly. So I, I'm living in a duplex. Go to file taxes on it this year. I get to depreciate 50% of it because I'm not living in the other 50%. That part is a rental. Yep. I... Uh, I have had LLCs for different things like the CDL school and my nonprofit, but I don't have an LLC for YouTube. I still have a YouTube cell phone, sure, a, a YouTube camera, a YouTube computer, 
a, a, an office space yep. about 100 square feet that's used specifically for YouTube at the, at the place. So they get to write off the office space. You don't need an entity. You don't need an LLC nope. for that. It comes off your, it because those are passed through entities. It's you doing it anyway. Mm -hmm. So I would have this bedroom. I would have a gaming computer, right? So when I say gaming computer right off, I spend $3,000 on a gaming computer. I associate about 80% of that with making money by selling right. things from the online thing, or 80% of it is used for YouTube. Right. So yeah, 20% is me. I pay taxes on it like anybody else, but did everyone else write off 80% of their computer? And again, it's, you're moving that 80% above the line. So what does that mean simply said? Basically, let's just use ref math. The computer was three grand. You're writing off two grand just for easy math. You're going to take that $2,000 and you're going to put it above the line, which means you deduct, like you'll take that $2,000 in expenses off your YouTube income. If you made $10,000 on YouTube, now you made eight. So you're taking that and you're reducing your tax implications. That's what above and below the line. Again, more and more people need to realize that the IRS tax code is a reward system, not a punishment system. And when you get that mindset and you work with a CPA that also has that mindset, it is a great hack, a great unlock. And that is frankly what the rich people do. The rich people look at the tax code and say, what is the IRS or AKA the government? What do they want me to do? Where are the incentives this year? Play by the rules. I mean, it's, it's, it's exactly right. When somebody says, you know, the rich don't pay any taxes. I mean, yes, you can go into how much do they pay in property taxes, wages for employees. They don't when play income taxes they don't pay income tax exactly because it, and it's like you said it's an incentive program what does what does the irs want people to do or what do the people in office tell the irs that we want people to do and if you can find a way to make money doing those things you eliminate one of most people's largest expenses yeah yeah taxes i mean uh, even above shelter taxes are your biggest expense and if you could find a way to legally legally reduce your tax exposure by doing something you already love to do, it is the income hack. It just is. You're going to have to learn it. You're going to have to get educated. You're going to have to do some research, but it is so worth the effort. Let me ask you this question this way, because it's probably going to be the title of the video. What are people missing about the creator economy? I think they're missing so much, but what do you, what do you think are some of the big things? Well, I think the, the biggest turnoff from it is there's probably not a lot of channels out there that say, here's how to make money in addition to your job. Mm -hmm. Most of the content out there is because of the dreamers. How do I quit my job? Yeah, that's not and, what I'm talking about. No. Right. And, and so it's like the person who says, I want to get into real estate. So I quit my job and got a real estate license. Now I have inconsistent income. I have no base to have income from and I'm not bankable. Right? Yeah, so how am not I bankable. Invest in real estate, yeah. right? yes. So if you... Get it, we can associate the two. If you get a real estate license and you grow on the side of your W-2, you're, you're doing open houses, you're doing lease signings, you're doing whatever it takes to build a client base so that over a couple of years, you've now got the client base and consistent income and understand what your income is going to look like. You understand the seasonality. You maybe have acquired a rental or two, the Graham Stefford method of having some rentals so you have that consistent income so you can handle the spiky income that comes from having the real estate license. The side hustle when it comes to the creator economy is the same. Yeah, I, I, I'm always cautious when I say if you're trying to do something like reach financial freedom, be careful of the guru, the person who only makes money from the content they create, but says, here's how you invest in real estate or here's how you buy stocks or here's how crypto set me free. But their course is where their money comes from. Yeah, you could. I think most people could live on what one rental at a time makes. Oh, yeah, but for sure. Okay. Not the first couple of years. Right, right. You had to have the marketability of here's how I reach financial freedom one rental at a time. My portfolio supports my mm -hmm. absolute 100% uh, of my retirement. I grew a side hustle. Now, the side hustle could be what people would say would reduce. You couldn't have done that. You couldn't have quit no. your job with no income and then started something online. So that's what I'm I think glad you, you're missing. I'm glad you, you bring this. that up. This is why I think this is why Gen X and baby boomers need to understand uh, the creator economy. Because I want you to do it. I want you to start while you're employed. I want you to do this while you're employed. Even if you do two or three things a week, but if you do them for two or three years, you will have something that for most of you will replace your income. Here are my numbers. Uh, I wish I had the slide, but I'll do it from memory. The first 12 months 
Remember, I just told you I had a multiple six figure year for this thing. For the first 12 months, I made less than three grand. 12 months. I think I did 1,800 videos. I wasn't monetized until like the, the 11th month. And I think my book went out at month 10, something like that. That's where the three grand came from. Year two, this is year two. I think I made 22 grand, maybe 24, something like that. Low, low to mid 20s. Again, 4,000 videos in, books, speaking engagements, all of those things. I've made less in two years combined than 30 grand. Now year three, my first six-figure year. Year four, my first multiple six-figure year. Year five, my first multiple, multiple six-figure year. At year five, I, for the first time, replaced my old W-2 income. But again, to your point, I couldn't have done, dude, I couldn't have dreamed of quitting. Even when I made six figures that third year, given where I live, not enough. It wasn't until the multiple six figures. Then you add on top of that the income hack, the income tax hack. Then you add on top of that the fact that I love what I do and it doesn't feel like a job. Then you add on top of that the community and the impact score and all these other things. There is nothing better than what I'm doing today, but you got to start while you're employed. Don't be a dreamer. Well, the impact of the community is the other thing that I think people miss with their their, their niche, right? So most of us, who invest in real estate would love to talk about real estate every now and then just a little bit, right? A little bit. Our friends and family aren't going to talk with us. And if they do, it's an argument. Oh, not yeah. right. So we, we make the channel, we interact in the communities. We go to the events, we meet the other like money people go to the local meetups. And, and so we go to our local Tacoma FI meetup here, 20 to 30 people, every single conversation, you don't have to explain the terminology. You don't have mm -hmm. to explain the motive. It's like nobody asks the wrong questions of why would you do that? They're like, how'd you do that? Right. And so you meet those people. So if you were into old car restoring yeah. and you, you were hanging around your friends and family and they just think you're weird because you spent a lot of time in the shop and you spent a lot of money on it. Yeah. Or you can interact with people online who know when the car shows are, who know yeah. where the deals are, who know where the in my area, it's there's a Mustang graveyard where you could go for all the parts for your car. When I was rebuilding my at a 1970 Mustang, which I lost in the divorce. And I kept telling all of my kids I would have traded any one of them for it. But you can interact with people who are into that thing. And the only way that you're going to find them is by being in that kind of community. Yeah. You know, the real magic. And I'm trying to prove this now with this whole buying Vegas thing. And Millennial Mike has already proven it. Pace Morby is already proving it. And that is deal flow. You really want to see yourself blow up, get deal flow. And again, you could talk about Mustangs, right? You want to talk about classic Mustangs. You never know when you could say on a channel, hey, I need a carburetor for a 1969 blah, blah, blah. You're going to tell the entire world. And if you have a great community, I promise you this. Someone out there is going to have it. Somebody out there will cut you a deal. And if you're really good, Somebody will give it to you for free. Something you desperately need and would pay money for. Someone would say, hey, I've, I had a 1969, but so it's total, blah, 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 but the carburetor works. You can have it, just pay shipping. Deal flow. Deal flow is the greatest unlock. When I look, when I look at what Pace Morby has done with what he calls Squad Up, that's his community. Pace Morby is a freaking genius. Because his deal flow is squad up. The guy probably makes eight figures, at least, from the deals that come from his community. He doesn't pay marketing for any of that. That is the, like, to me, that is like the top of the hill of social media and creator economy. When you could be so well known in a space, you could have so many passionate, fanatic fans. That when you put something out there, like, hey, I'm going to try to buy cash flow in Vegas like I did on my daily show today, they bring you deals. That And that that's not a multiple six figures. That's a seven figure unlock. And again, the magic is you're doing it with what you love. In your example, classic Mustangs. That's the great unlock. So uh, 
it's too, it sucks that it takes me like 10 minutes to get this down because I would do a whiteboard on, on the triangle of, of how to succeed in almost any business. Because at the base, you've got at the bottom of the triangle, you've got the general person, the, the general contractor, the person who has the basic information, the, the investor. Above that, a, a little bit smaller of a group of people in the triangle, you have the specialist, right? So the orthodontist makes more money than the dentist. The surgeon makes more money than the doctor, right? It kind of breaks mm -hmm. down like that. And then at the top, you have celebrity authority. Right. The person people know of when they think of the subject, right? If, if, if in your area, <clears throat> which real estate agent has all the billboards? Yep. So that was the, the eighties and nineties way of the, you could, the park benches, right? Yep. You, you'd see the, the, that kind of thing. Well, now it's, if you look up Gary, Indiana, you see millennial Mike, probably you see millennial Mike before you see any real estate agent when it comes probably. to real because, because he has that celebrity authority. So if you can get to that top of that triangle, in your niche and whatever it is, whether it's, it could be anything. It, there's a chess channel on YouTube, Gotham yeah. chess, 900,000 views on a video in a couple of days. Wow. If chess comes up, that's who they're talking to. Yeah. I, I'm, I, I'm getting a lowest delivery. Sorry. Oh, it's okay. You want to go take care of that or? Sorry. I just keep going. If that happens again, I'm, I'm expecting many minutes. I'm getting a refrigerator and a hot water heater for my other unit delivered today, finally. And then we're buttoned up by there next you go. week. So. Oh, that's very cool. Very cool. So at the end of the day, the creator economy is out there. It's it's. I think it's easier to get a part of. It's fun, especially if you see this is the big, this is the big unlock for the creator economy. You have to do it around something you love. You can't fake it. You can't pretend. You can't chase money. But if you do it around something you love, it's just... It makes it so easy to build momentum. And this is all about momentum going forward. What do you think? And it is going to start slow. Just like in real estate, you got those first five years, they suck. Yep. The first the first few months, it's going to feel awkward no matter what you're doing. Yeah. Right. And, and then it's going to be slow and frustrating. And you will, and you can compare yourself in real estate too. You'll you'll hear about the 20-year-old the with 30 rentals. Can't buy beer yet, but he's got 30 rentals. Yeah. You'll hear about somebody who makes a YouTube channel. Two weeks later has a hundred thousand subscribers. Yeah, it happens. That's not how it goes. That's not how real estate normally goes. That's not how the creator economy usually goes. It's going to be slow. It's going to feel awkward. The easier you make it, the more likely you are to continue with it. And then the rewards after, because a lot of it is residual. Yeah, I totally agree. At the end of the day, I will say the first five years suck in real estate. If you're part of the creator economy, I think it's the first two years. If, you, if you're really consistent, it's something you love, you show up, you keep doing it. That third year is where I saw the momentum build. But the first year sucked. Yeah, yeah. the, the first year with YouTube, because because here's the problem with the creator economy. When you start doing something, our friends and family are the most judgmental people we're ever going to meet. Yeah. And the, the random stranger who wants the information you're putting out is going to be very thankful and appreciative versus mm -hmm. your friends and family who are going to critique criticized yes. try to talk you out of it because part of their fear is that you'll be successful yeah isn't that wild well dion you're amazing thank you for being part of this we want you to go pick up your lowest thing where can people find you right here on youtube dion talk financial freedom thank you buddy i appreciate you thank you